Krishna. So we are discussing the journey of self-discovery. We're on the uh, part, the fourth part, which is called the spiritual master, and the uh, uh, particular chapter we're dealing with is a chapter called, uh, what is it called after all? Uh, Show Bottle Spiritualist Exposed, that's what it is. Show Bottle Spiritualist Exposed. So um, this is a, a chapter that has to do with the spiritual master, particularly what the spiritual master isn't. You know, uh, as we discussed before, this particular chapter talks about uh, how the spiritual master can be, uh, how one can be misled to accept someone who's not a genuine spiritual master. And we're going to kind of review that today because I think it's an important uh, topic. Uh, the uh, actual uh, chapter starts off with Prabhupada having a back and forth with uh, a Los Angeles CBS television reporter. And the uh, exchange uh, is described like this in Los Angeles, December 30th, 1968. A CBS television news reporter asked for Srila Prabhupada's comments on the many newly arisen gurus of the late 60s who were promising, among other things, power, influence success, I'm sorry, stress control, and salvation. This no hold barred interview exposes many current religious philosophies and practices. Srila Prabhupada declares, the man who says he's God, he is rascal number one. So uh, we uh, kind of uh, talked about some of these various uh, gurus and uh, teachers, self-styled, they uh, have, you know, popped up now and again. And every so often we get a new one. Of course, uh, the one that uh, probably is the most uh, 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 well, not maybe well-known, but the one that started the whole thing off is uh, Ramakrishna. So... Um, you know, this is just a little excerpt from Wikipedia. Not a big thing. I'm not going to get into it very much. But as I spoke about last week, Ramakrishna tried a little bit of everything. And um, mostly when people have not systematically uh, studied the Vedas, when they haven't done it systematically, then what happens is that their version or their understanding of spiritual life is helter-skelter, it's eclectic. They don't honestly know what spiritual life is. You cannot just read the Vedas and genuinely understand spiritual life. Nor can you uh, just uh, figure it out on your own. You can't figure out spiritual life on your own, and you can't just read the Vedas. You have to have a spiritual guide. And that spiritual guide has to be a genuine spiritual guide. And the reason we say it's genuine, or the reason we uh, make this distinction, and what we make this distinction on, is that the spiritual guide has to come from a chain of spiritual guides. So spiritual guides don't just fall out of the clouds. They aren't just born, nor are they zapped with some electricity from some other spiritual guide. Spiritual guide is someone who has followed a proper spiritual guide and gradually through accepting the austerity and the regulation of one's own spiritual guide, one can become qualified to be a spiritual guide. But not otherwise. You cannot do that. You cannot just create a tradition out of thin air. Uh, traditions do not come out of thin air. Traditions are uh, 
something that have been around for a long time. If someone thinks that they've suddenly discovered how to actually do spiritual practice, that means that for all this time, for thousands and thousands of years, nobody had any idea what spiritual life was or religion was. And Joe Schmo figured it out, you know, maybe a, a couple of weeks ago or a few months ago or maybe last year. Uh, this doesn't sound very likely. And uh, so we say that uh, spiritual life is not something helter-skelter. It's not guesswork. It's not vague nor is it up in the clouds, nor do people make it up as they go along. It must be passed down. It must be solid. It must be coming from somewhere. It must have stayed the same through many generations and many hundreds and thousands of years. And there, it's not true that you can just make any kind of thing and if you're sincere, it'll work. That's also not true. Just flying by the seat of your pants, trying to find out spiritual life on your own, that will not work. So um, you have to be actually coming from a tradition. That tradition has to be bona fide. And... Uh, the people that are a part of that tradition have to have the same opinion as one another, and they have to be actually practicing that opinion. We'll kind of showcase these things again in a minute. But uh, why does I have to press five or six times to finally get somebody to admit today? There, They come in, and I press to admit them, and they seem to still hover there and I press again and they're still hovering there and I press the third time finally they come in I um, every day every time with zoom there's some new uh, interesting thing going on that uh, we have to figure out why do we do that you know okay so um, here is uh, the main themes that uh, have been a part of this uh, part of our uh, discussion. And this chapter showcases these particular main themes, and they are the Western world is easily fooled by spiritual charlatans. Uh, what the difference is between Vaishnavism and Christianity, we do talk a little bit about comparative religion in this uh, particular dialogue between the CBS news reporter and Prabhupada. And we do talk about the practicality of Krishna consciousness. And by practicality, I mean two different things. One of them is that uh, Krishna consciousness is a simple brass tacks down to earth uh, set of activities that will make a difference in your life. The other thing I mean by practicality is that um, uh, somebody is really making a lot of noise in the background there. Okay, so uh, by practicality, it means that there is a, uh, um, that the, it's a, a brass tacks down to earth uh, set of practices that one can do. They're not uh, airy-fairy. They're not guesswork. They're not seat of the pants. They're not, you know, whatever, whenever. They're actually quite uh, chalked out. And the other practicality part, aspect of the practicality is that if you do them, they actually work. So they're practical in that sense, that uh, they're not just uh, platitudes or shibboleths or uh, some kind of pie in the sky, uh, you know, uh, self-help uh, totems. They're actually real practices, and if one does them, one gets real results. And of course, the fourth thing that kind of gets talked about in this um, uh, particular chapter is the bluff of science. 
So science is um, always claiming it has the answer to whatever problem that we are facing. <coughs> Mala? Yeah. Uh, uh, just a quick question, because I just got led into the meeting. Uh-huh. When you said to do the practices and they really work, which I just want to get, I just want to kind of get caught up. Which practices are you referring to? We're talking about the practices. Are you talking of, about? Yeah, we're talking about the practices of bhakti yoga, you know. Uh, Perfect, because I don't know if you were talking about like those other. You just vanished. Or maybe I just vanished. I vanished. That's what happened. Oh, my God. Now I'm back, it appears. Oh, I am back from the other world. I froze, and uh, the demigods in charge of bandwidth have not smiled on me today. I'm not being uh, punished <laughs> for not performing the proper oblations for the... Uh, <laughs> I have to figure out which demigods are in charge of bandwidth, you know, so uh, I can get this up. <laughs> Somebody was telling me the other day that this is, uh, you know, Venus, or Mercury is in retrograde and all the machines go wild when <laughs> when Mercury goes. I'm, I'm serious, in, in the astrological circles, uh, when uh, Mercury goes into w retrograde, all the machines do all kinds of crazy things. So uh, maybe that's over well, right now, I hope so. When did, when, did Metro, when did it go into retrograde? I don't know. Uh, I don't really follow astrology, but... Uh, Somebody told me that the other day, and I've heard it before. And uh, and whenever people talk about met Mercury in retrograde, I do notice that uh, the g gadgets and gizmos that I have to work with are particularly uh, tricky. They uh, perform all kinds of sneaky pranks on me. So uh, it's part of my uh, well, Raj, I, I so. torture. You've been having... You've been having this issue for a little while. That's why I was wondering yeah, yeah. how long Mercury um, has been in retrograde. Well, you know, uh, the bandwidth issue is something that's always going to be there. You know, uh, uh, at any rate, let's continue. I don't want to digress too far for too long. At any rate, here is uh, the uh, four things that this particular... Um, chapter deals with the Western world is easily fooled, the difference between Vaishnavism and Christianity, the practicality of Krishna consciousness, and the bluff of science. So science tells us they've got all the answers, but somehow or another we're still dealing with a lot of problems. Of course, okay, so let's move on here. Um, the uh, particular chapter that we have dealt with has been called show bottle spiritualist that's the uh, uh, name of it and uh, so what we are trying to understand is what do we mean if we have something that's fake or show bottle excuse me then if something's fake there has to be the genuine article there has to be the genuine thing and what could that genuine thing be well how would we know it and this is, I think, the most important part of this uh, particular chapter, or the most important theme, is to get a handle on what we actually mean by a authentic spiritual guide, as opposed to, you know, a uh, self-made God. So uh, let's take a look at how uh, Merriam-Webster defines authenticity. Uh, not false or copied. It's also genuine and real. An authentic uh, antique means it's a real antique. It's not something that uh, was made two weeks ago and then scuffed up to look like it was, you know, a century old. Having an origin supported by unquestionable evidence, authenticated, verified. So that's another definition of authenticity. 
having an authentic document of the Middle Ages, an authentic work of an old master. So authentic means that uh, it really did originate in the past. It really was uh, coming from a source that it claims it comes from. Okay, now another meaning of authenticity is representing one's true nature or beliefs, true to oneself or person I, or the person identified. And this is actually a different meaning of authenticity, but a very important meaning. So usually authenticity or being authentic means that um, something is what it says it is, that something comes from where it says it comes from, or something is uh, put forward as being what it's claimed to be. These are all kind of uh, ideas of authenticity. But there's another and very different meaning of authenticity, which means that someone's intentions are what they claim their intentions are. And this is something that often is not the case. Uh, our world is full of situations where people's intentions are not what they claim their intentions are. And this is why our society is very um, troubled and why people find it hard to have faith in others because uh, oftentimes people put forward a air of uh, wanting to help. They put forward a uh, uh, pledge to be a guide. They put forward a guarantee or a uh, promise to deliver something, but they can't actually do it. They don't actually do it. And in some cases, they're not, they don't even intend to do it. They just want to put forward an image like that. So this is inauthenticity in a different way. No one can see what goes on in the heart or mind of another person. The only way we can know is to hear from them what they say is coming from their heart and mind. You know, we can't read minds and there's no way to read uh, hearts either. However, by watching somebody's uh, activities, in other words, what they do, what they spend their time on, what they appear to hold important, by that method, we can find out what is in their heart. So if somebody says that they are really, really uh, wanting to uh, change the world, but we never see them do anything that uh, amounts to any kind of practical activity, then although they're saying that, we tend to doubt their commitment. And in this way, we feel they're being inauthentic. They're not presenting who they really are or what they really uh, uh, believe. So that's a different version of the word authentic. And then... Um, A story told to an authentic voice, of, uh, told in the authentic voice of a Western farmer, a senator's speech that sounded authentic, entitled to acceptance or belief because of agreement with known facts or experience, reliable, trustworthy. So this again is authentic meaning kind of truth that uh, something presents an idea and that idea is uh, tallies with the actual facts on the street. So if somebody paints a picture with their words and uh, that picture with their words tallies with what we see go down on the street, then we say that that's authentic, that it's truthful. And so this is another uh, uh definition of authentic and you know uh, so we've basically uh, talked about it the other uh, definitions for authentic are um, kind of uh, niche 
uses of the word authentic in uh, uh, regions like music and uh, law and other things like that. So I'm not going to get into that. But um, the basic idea of authentic (coughs) is that something presents itself for what it is and that what something presents is what it actually is the reality of the situation in the world. It's not presenting something that has no reality in the world, not presenting something which won't work in the world, not presenting something which uh, will, in the long run, not deliver the goods. So uh, this is why we have to talk about uh, the meaning of authenticity. These are some of the uh, definitions and some of the items we can look for. I asked the first time we started this uh, particular chapter, and you all came up with many of these same ideas yourselves, so that's good. So you already have a sense of these things. Let's uh, turn to the uh, written section here. So Prabhupada was having a dialogue with this uh, CBS News reporter, and uh, Prabhupada... um, was uh, asked by the reporter uh, about these various show bottle gurus that were coming from India and purporting to give people mystical experiences, purporting to relieve them of stress, purporting to uh, make them happy, purporting to give them some kind of um, advantage in life. Uh, But what were they really? And so Prabhupada says, yes, that uh, he's talking about the uh, uh, Western people. They're looking for spiritual life. They feel that um, the traditional ways have promised it, but really haven't delivered. They're ready for looking for another channel. And so when somebody comes from across the water and explains these things, then uh, they're ready to try to give it a, a a spin to see if it works. So here Prabhupada is uh, responding to this question of the reporter about these various uh, self-styled gurus and godmen coming from India. Srila Prabhupada, yes, they want something very cheap. So this is the Western people. They want something very cheap. That is their fault. Now for our disciples, We don't give anything cheap. Our first condition is character, moral character. You see, unless one is strictly following moral principles, we don't initiate him. We don't allow him in this institution. And this so-called guru has been telling people, just do whatever you like. Simply pay me $35 and I'll give you a mantra, you see. So people want to be cheated. And so many cheaters come. People do not wish to undergo any discipline. They have got money, so they think, we shall pay. And immediately we shall get whatever we want. So this is an important uh, idea. That um, the world is full of what Prabhupada used to talk about all the time as the cheaters and the cheated. It's interesting that karma creates a situation where people who want something, but they don't want the real thing because it's too troubling, uh, will be given a version of the thing that they want, but it'll be a bogus version of it, a two-dimensional version of it, a watered-down version of it, an insubstantial version of it. So this is the um, collaboration of the cheaters and the cheated. Uh, The cheaters, they want to take some money. They want to uh, have some position. The cheaters, they want to um, have some followers. And so they tell people what those people want to hear. Is not necessarily what they what will be better for them, and it's not necessarily the truth. But when you tell people what they want to hear, you get results. 
There's no doubt about it. That's what demagogues are all about. Not demigods, but demagogues. So uh, the um, process of understanding what people want to hear and telling people what they want to hear is an instant path to popularity, fame, uh, notoriety, uh, uh, power. People are uh, ready to line up. So in other places, Prabhupada said that if someone teaches the truth, he will be uh, hated and beat with sticks. But if somebody speaks some great nonsense, some big lie, people will line up and be ready to pay the money. So this is, again, this reciprocation, this uh, uh, fool's uh, ship of fools between the cheaters and the cheated, which you see go down everywhere. Somebody wants to get rich in the world, and someone comes along and tells them, oh, yes, I know the stock market. I know if you make this investment, especially this stock, this one right now, you have to buy it right now because in five years, it'll be worth 20 times as much, you know, uh, just like Apple was, you know, before, and now it's so huge. If you buy this stock, you, you will make millions. And, of course, the person does it, and the stock doesn't make any change, and they lose their money. So... Uh, uh, this kind of thing is there. People uh, want some kind of magic formula to make money. They go to a cheater. The cheater takes their money and tells them some advice that doesn't help. Or worse yet, tells them some advice which has disastrous results for them. People want to lose some weight, so they go to someone and they learn some dietary uh, plan. They follow it, and it turns out they don't really lose any weight. Uh, people want to elect a politician. The politician promises he'll deliver peace and prosperity. Why not? It's what every politician promises. Peace and prosperity. Let's have some peace and prosperity. I'll, I'll make it happen. And, of course, when they get elected, there's no delivery on the peace and prosperity. Things go on as much as they did or it get worse. And people want some uh, quick way to learn a musical instrument. They want some quick way to get buff by uh, some kind of uh, physical uh, uh, physical education. They want to uh, learn some special diet that will uh, do some magical thing for them. And in this way, we find that uh, there are people who are selling things that will not work but everyone's willing to uh, line up and pay money for it. And once they pay money for it, then they discover it doesn't work. But uh, the cheater has made his money, and the person has gotten what they wanted. They didn't really want to do the hard work it takes to either learn a musical instrument or the hard work it would take to actually become uh, physically powerful by exercising. They didn't actually want to do the hard work of what it meant to study the stock market and understand finance so they could know whether an investment was good or not. They didn't really want to do the hard work it would take to really understand government and political systems and what it would really take to help people become wealthier and uh, more prosperous and to uh, learn how to diffuse the uh, various sources that lead to warfare. So uh, all these things are uh, two-dimensional show bottle versions of ideas or systems sold by people who want some advantage, or in some cases are themselves befooled by some system that is not really uh, workable. So we can have a system that's not really workable, and we can go on for some time, and eventually it's proven that that system is a failure. The communist system is a perfect example of this, that... Uh, Back some years ago, uh, you know, 
70 years ago or wherever it was, 70, 80 years ago, the um, uh, philosophers were talking about Karl Marx and how wonderful it would be if everybody was just uh, 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 working together and there were no big uh, industrial owners who were cruel and took huge amounts of profit and squeezed the poor laborers and so forth and so on. And eventually it came to be an actual political movement. And uh, through many bloody revolutions, it took power. And over the years, there was all this uh, uh, important uh, documentation, all this propaganda. Uh, so many people were showing, you know, that uh, the, or speaking about how the communist system was so superior to the Western capitalistic system. And then, uh, you know, some years ago, not that long ago, the whole communist system collapsed in the 1980s, 1990s. The entire thing went down the tubes. And uh, communist Russia reinvented itself as not so communist. And uh, the, um, it was a system that sounded good. It was a system that people, some people genuinely believed in. But at the same time, the years proved that it didn't bring anything beneficial to the table. Uh, of course, there were many different communist rulers, and they each had a slightly different take on communism. But... Uh, as time wore on, we see that none of them seemed to be able to take this so-called idea that was supposed to liberate the workers and make the world better. None of them were able to do that and uh, make a genuine world that was better for anybody. And for the couple of three places in the world where communism is still the uh, reigning you know, political system, things are not good at all. You know, so um, at any rate, we can see this is what I'm pointing towards, that some people are presenting or mouthing some kind of system, and they capture people who are believers that they actually know what they're talking about. And in some cases, they get put in positions of, uh, of uh, power, positions where they make money, positions where they have influence and because these are cheaters they don't uh, deliver the goods they can't deliver the goods all they can do is give people things that look like an answer look like a solution but over time it's seen that these are not real solutions and the whole thing falls apart that's the nature of truth truth can stand the test of time and uh Falsity cannot stand the test of time. Falsity will always collapse. Superficialness will always finally collapse sooner or later, but mostly sooner. So um, this is why we're looking for something that will be long term. And uh, uh, let's see who we've got here that could read today. Maybe we'll start off with Cynthia. If she can see it, let me uh, pop it over from the screen here. Can you read that, Cynthia? Yes, I, I can, Marge. Okay, so you can start with Instant Heaven there. I'm starting with... Yeah, Instant Heaven. Let me ask you. What's that? Where am I starting at? Let me ask you. No, instant heaven. Journalist says instant heaven. Okay. Journalist. Instant heaven. Srila Prabhupada. Yes, that is their foolishness. Journalist. Let me ask you. I have my opinion, but let me ask you. Why do you feel that the younger people today are turning more and more toward the Eastern-oriented religions? Srila Prabhupada. Because your materialistic way of life no longer satisfies them. In America, especially, you have got enough for enjoyment. You have got enough food, enough women, enough wine, enough houses, enough of everything. 
but you still have confusion and dissatisfaction more in your country than in India, which is said to be very poverty stricken. But you will find in India that although they are poverty stricken, they are continuing their old spiritual culture. So people are not as disturbed. This shows that material advancement alone cannot give one satisfaction. If they really want satisfaction, people must take to spiritual life. That will make them happy. All these people, they are in darkness. There is no hope. They do not know. Can you scroll up a little, Mark? Yeah, I did already. Can you not see it? Or maybe I'm frozen. No, I'm not frozen. Anybody out there, I'm starting to hear crickets. <laughs> I must be frozen. I can still hear okay. you, Marat. Okay. Can you, uh, so Cynthia, are you still there? Evidently not. I got bumped off. Yeah, you got frozen. So I thought I was getting frozen. Can Johnny send me an email here? What's that? In Johnny sent a message that he cannot hear. I don't know if it's a he or in Johnny Jinnery. Uh, just sent a message that he can't oh, hear. See. That he can't hear. Who can't hear? Let me take a look at the chat. Oh, she's saying she cannot hear. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. So it looks like uh, the uh, demigods in charge of bandwidth <laughs> are not smiling on queens now. They were uh, <laughs> g tormenting us here in Brooklyn, but they have moved over to queens. <laughs> Maharaj, yeah. Maharaj, by yeah. the way, I wanted to apologize if my comment was out of line when you were talking about Mercury retrograde. I was just kind of being light and playful. But if I said anything out of line, please forgive me. I'm so sorry. I didn't mean no, it's to not be a big, it's not a big deal. It's not a big deal. Uh, you know, I, you know, I'm just trying to keep this also as well as informative and kind of, uh, you know, down the straight and narrow as far as where the scripture goes, but also, you know, it's it's better if it is light in some ways too. So, uh, well, uh, I'm I'm just grateful that you give us programs. So thank you. All right, all right. So uh, are Indrani and Cynthia back? It looks like they are, but Cynthia is muted. It looks like. All right, someone's coming. All right, so uh, we'll, while Cynthia is getting uh, her internet back together, whatever it takes to do that. Uh, uh, and Johnny is saying, but well, I think their internet is giving them a problem. Yeah, that's what I'm, I was saying, too, that uh, the... Uh, Demigods in charge of the internet are uh, moved over to giving some grief to uh, our friends in Queens and uh, have lightened up on us here in Brooklyn. So, at any rate, <laughs> let's. Uh, 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 that will make them happy. All these people, they are in darkness. There is no hope. They do not know where they are going. They have no aim. But when you are spiritually situated, you know what you are doing and where you are going. Everything is clear. So we spoke a little bit about that, about the um, cheaters and the cheated culture. So uh, let me see if I can get somebody else. Cynthia is... Uh, trying to get back in again here uh, if I can get somebody else to read the section uh, next here so uh, okay so that's good um, wait 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 boop 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 <laughs> all right no that's okay to me thank you very much uh, so um, this is uh, the issue that um, 
Prabhupada is making here, the fact that the Vedas have detailed explanations for things uh, is an important aspect of the Vedic system. And that uh, you cannot build a religion or make progress in a religion and at the same time have all kinds of bad habits that you don't even know are bad habits and you have no intention of giving up. So these are the two points that Prabhupada is making there. This is an important uh, couple of points that uh, to understand spiritual life, you have to have some details. Uh, it's not enough just to um, have some vague ideas, some shibboleths, some uh, platitudes, some uh, mottos that we should follow. Of course, those are good, but uh, it's hard to become strong. It's hard to become determined to follow any kind of uh, moral and spiritual path when we don't know why we should do it and we don't know what will happen to us if we don't. And um, that's why uh, having detailed knowledge is such a, an important thing. And uh, this is why we have to be very careful when we give spiritual knowledge to not only just explain what the Vedas say, but also uh, give our own testimonials and, and show how it fits together. And if we can make a good case for things fitting together, those who are uh, more reasonable and those who can follow the logic that we're uh, putting aside, uh, such people may be influenced positively. Uh, that doesn't mean necessarily they will become Hare Krishnas and join our movement, but at least they will begin to see the wisdom of uh, what we're teaching. And... As far as I'm concerned, that's as good as anything else, you know. Uh, Prabhupada never encouraged that people had to change their religion. However, he did say that if you're genuinely following a religion and uh, you are aware of some of the Krishna conscious principles, you can certainly, certainly, certainly make use of them in your own religion. Of course, religions have done this since time immemorial. I'm not a, uh, <clears throat> a naive uh, baby about this. That uh, uh, If you really look at the histories of religions, they've always interacted. On the surface, being at war with one another philosophically, but uh, in private, hidden under the cloak of, uh, you know, uh, various kinds of... Uh, uh, intrigue and uh, mystery, they can recognize a good idea when they hear it. And they sometimes have to come up with some different words to put out that same idea. But, you know, just like anything else, truth works, everything else flops. So if you hear some truth, uh, even if it's coming from another religion, you may never acknowledge that it's coming from religion. Okay, we don't care. Uh, but if it works, use it. And uh, the actual process of religion will change your life if you actually understand what it is. So Krishna consciousness has a lot of things to tell us about who God is, exactly how God does what he does, why he does some of the more unusual things that people find difficult to grasp about God. We have answers for those uh, things. The Vedas are not silent about those things. But because the Vedas are so intricate and there's so many layers to them, uh, we can easily put into perspective the Bible and the various literatures of other religions because we can understand what they were getting at and whether something in that religion is an important principle or it's a minor detail that's not really that significant. It must be always understood that in all scriptures. Marge, I have a question. Yes, I think. Uh, Prabhupada says that because the people in India, they practice their culture, 
I I know some people just go to the pundits and they do some kind of um, austerity. Um, do they they just get benediction for that? Do the are the pundits counted as bogus screws because they're not giving all that they know to whoever comes to them? That's a good question. Um, what you'll see in this whole discussion is that there are shades of gray all the way down the line, you know. Uh, some things are better than others, you know, that you follow a pundit or something like that. Certainly not the highest uh, uh, goal from the Vaishnav point of view. However, it's better than a lot of other things, you know. And similarly, if someone's going to church, even if they don't really know what they're doing or even if they're not really a attempting to better their moral or uh, spiritual character, they're still doing something positive. And we talked about some of these various uh, show bottle gurus that came. Some of them were just a regular menace, actually. Some, some were really the world would have been much better without them, you know. But others were ones that were putting forward other spiritual uh, theories and other spiritual goals that are directly or indirectly mentioned in the Vedas, uh, which is, you know, better than living a life of just getting what you want in crude material methods. So uh, it's better than that. So the re Vedic religion or the Vedic scriptures talk about what we call poverty marg and nivriti marg. And poverty marg is where you follow various pundits and various um, uh, rituals. But what's the purpose of those rituals? The rituals are supposed to uh, either directly invoke auspiciousness or the other idea is that those various rituals are supposed to uh, please various demigods. And by pre pleasing various demigods, then we hope we will get something from them. So some rituals are to um, invoke auspicious uh, events to happen in our lives, and others are to please demigods, again, with the idea of hoping that various auspicious events will take place in our lives. Now, it is possible to also worship God in the same way. We're not worshiping God because he's God and because we love him, we're worshiping God because he's a tool to help us get our material desires. And this is far better than worshiping demigods or uh, performing pious activities. It's far better because at least God's in the picture now. However, the highest thing is to worship God because he's God and uh, not worry about what happens to us as a result or what comes back the other way. Because we know that the Supreme Lord only does things for our benefit anyway. And uh, we are not using him as a tool or a springboard or a waitress to give us what we want. We're using him uh, in none of those ways. We want to please God because that's what life is really about. That's what spiritual life really is. Of course, granted, we don't feel the authentic tendency to do that. That's not natural for us because for many lifetimes we have ignored God. And now uh, trying to reorient our lives around God is like pulling teeth. But if we perform the activities of bhakti yoga uh, the practices of hearing and chanting, remembering, doing various kinds of service, offering our food, following regular principles. If we do these things, then our tendency to uh, uh, spontaneously <coughs> feel a desire to serve God just to serve God will grow to the point where we will find it quite natural to do that. So um, it's a, it's a uh, shades of gray thing. Um, in Bhagavad Gita, 
<clears throat> although it's not mentioned directly in Bhagavad Gita, there is a notion of a uh, yoga ladder, of various kinds of uh, activities or performances that are a little better than other activities. And they kind of show an overall grayscale or a uh, ladder, if you will, of moving from having very little consciousness of God or even morality to being very aware of the Supreme Lord and actually having a ongoing relationship with him. So uh, there's a, a level in between. And that's why as we talk about these uh, show bottle spiritualists, some of them that we mention were just really trying to make a buck and they didn't know nothing from nothing. And they inspired people to do things which were actually ruinous for their spiritual uh, life. While, whereas others, you know, had some moral principles or others had some connection with the Vedas in some kind of way. And in that way, they helped uh, a little bit. So people who want to go for poverty mark to use uh, the Vedas or, uh, or the demigods or even God to fulfill their material desires, that's a lot better than a lot of other things, especially if they're using God to fulfill their material desires. God may not fulfill their desires. I mean, he's God. He, he knows what's best for us. Um, and uh, But if someone approaches God for fulfilling a material desire, that's the best thing they could do because um, eventually... If you continue to do that, you will lose the desire to approach God for a material motivation, and you will start to gain the taste to approach God sans material motivation, where you will want to serve God just for God's sake. So in second canto, it says, Akama Savakamo Va Moksha Kama Udharadi Tivrena Bhakti Yogena Yajete Purusham Param. That whether one has no material desires, akama, sarvakama, whether one has all material desires, or moksha garma, one wants to desire for liberation, uh, akama, samakama, sava, sarvakama, va, moksha kama, udharadi, tivrena, bhakti yogena, yajeta purushamparam. So still, one should with all determination and steadfastness perform uh, service to God. Because even if we are approaching God with a material motivation, we will eventually be purified of that material motivation. But heck, if we can recognize that early on and we start to realize that it's kind of shabby to approach the Supreme Being with a uh, you know Christmas list in your back pocket, it's kind of shabby. Uh, and uh, you can uh, learn to overcome that tendency. And we too, you know, as devotees, we understand it, yet we understand how steeped in uh, many lifetimes we have been in that attitude. So it's not easy to overcome that attitude. But the scriptures guarantee us if we simply, humbly, day by day, grain by grain, minute by minute, uh, bit by bit, we follow the practice of of bhakti yoga year in and year out, we will find that our tendency towards always calculating what our Christmas list should be will finally diminish. And we will be left with serving God just to serve God. And once we reach that, hey, that's it. That's We're out of the material world. That's what makes the difference. So you'll find people at the various levels on the yoga ladder those who have uh, not discovered that uh, getting what you want in any kind of way has repercussions and it will cause you more pain than it will give you happiness. And then you have those who haven't discovered God yet, but they have faith in the Vedas or in the demigods, so they're performing various uh, sacrifices and uh, propitiations. And then you have those who have discovered God, but they haven't discovered that approaching God to have him fulfill your desires is a kind of third-class attitude. Uh, then you have those people who have discovered that material sense gratification 
cannot be the goal of life, that uh, it never works, so it can't be a real goal. But they don't know what the real goal is yet. And then you have those who've discovered yoga, and those people have a process for a mystical experience within. But finally, you get to the stage where we talk about bhakti, where someone understands that we should be serving God just for the sake of serving God. And if we do that, Everything will come and go, our uh, life will come and go, our money will come and go, our family will come and go, our relatives will come and go, the years will come and go. But one thing that won't come and go is our relationship with the Supreme. Even if we don't make it this lifetime, we'll make it in a soon lifetime. So uh, that's how I'd respond to your uh, question about that, you know. So uh, from a philosophical angle, we deride these lower platforms, but at the same time, we know that not everybody is going to rise to the higher platforms, and the lower platforms also have their functionality. They also uh, preserve a, uh, uh, a way for certain people who have certain mental, you know, um, obstacles it allows them to go so far and kind of dig in and stop and not go any farther, at least for the time being. So, anyway. <laughs> so, by practicing these yagnas and doing the, what they're doing, they're just going to take birth into a step closer to knowing about God. Well... To becoming a bit more aware of God. Yeah, at least they have that uh, opportunity. There's another principle at work, which is an interesting principle, and that, that is that no matter how much pious work you do, you will never become devotionally inclined. The only way you can become devotionally inclined is to become emotion devotionally inclined. <laughs> so it mentions in the uh, Madhurya Kadambani and also in the Harinam Chintamani that... Uh, you can perform yagyas till your uh, till the whole day of Brahma is over. You know you can go from one lifetime to another, uh, as long as you still maintain a material motivation. You will never move that next step up to being a, a, a bhakta. Although that's kind of the plan in the Vedas, uh, the missing puzzle piece is that. Because you're performing pious activity, say you're worshiping demigods or you're learning from a pundit, you know, how to perform various sacrifices or you're paying the pundit to perform various sacrifices in your home. Um, as you're doing that, you will likely be in places where you may run across someone who's an actual devotee. And the devotee will go, hey, slap, 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 slap wake up, Bubba, you know, uh, how long are you going to be doing this, you know? Uh, it's, it's not going to do you any good in the long run, you know? You're, you may get some uh, baubles and uh, beads and, uh, you know, uh, uh, gold dust, but what's the use of it, you know? Uh, you might as well learn that the Supreme Lord is the real deal. He's the center of everything. And, uh, you know... It's that interaction with someone who is actually connected with the bhakti system that pulls a person out of the what we call the karma system. So uh, the karma system is a system where one is um, performing various religious activities with the ambition to please the Lord, but with the further ambition to then ask the Lord for various material benedictions, you know. So that's called the karma process. Usually we call that karma yoga. Uh, but when we become a bhakta, then uh, we no longer, at least theoretically, hold that conception. We may still have a tendency towards that, but we know that it's incorrect, and we're trying to work away from it. So... Yes, there is a sort of plan that through the association 
with uh, people in pious, uh, you know, Brahminical communities, one at least is not doing egregious activities that cause harm to others. However, they will never become devotees unless they meet a devotee and the devotee convinces them of the uselessness of the process of karma. So this is why when we get the opportunity, when we get an open mind, you know, we try to pull someone that step up from the karma process to the devotional or bhakti process. If they're not hearing it, then we let them be. You know, what else are you going to do? You know, it's the thing that Vaisheshika always talks about, the green mango, you know. You got a green mango, well, you don't pull it off the tree, you let it ripen, you know. So it's the same thing. Uh, some people are ready to hear and some are not. But what the performing of pious activities does do is it puts you in locations and in associations of people which up your uh, uh, probability of encountering somebody who's actually a bhakta and will, you know, pull you up one more notch into bhakti out of your karmic or, you know, pull you up into uh, nivrti marg out of your poverty marg. Uh-oh. My we Zoom is warning me again that my internet's becoming unstable. But I'm still broadcasting live here, right? I'm still uh, coming across. Yeah. Okay, good, you. good. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. So uh, let's move along here a little bit more. Um, I wanted to... Um, take some quick time here. I don't want to make a big deal out of these things, but, uh, you know, we have, uh, discussed some of these people. I'm not going to discuss them all, but, um, we had, of course, Vivekananda, who was someone who made, um, um, Ramakrishna famous. Uh, Ramakrishna would have never been famous without Vivekananda. And Vivekananda was one of the first people to leave India and come to the United States, and he was the one that uh, made the uh, famous uh, speech at the World Parliament of Religions in Chicago, and he wowed the world at that time, you know, for uh, saying some things that really don't amount to a lot. But, uh, you know, he was someone who was impersonalist in his, uh, you know, leanings, and uh, he had a lot of um, uh, various mixed ideas from various traditions, just like Ramakrishna did. As we talked about last week, Ramakrishna, he was at one time a Muslim, a Christian, he was uh, a Shakta worshiper, he was a Shaivite, you name it, he did it, you know. And so he was kind of a wash in all the different traditions, though he never apparently ever settled down into any one tradition. So um, Vivekananda was not quite that uh, blown out, but something in that same category. So although they established an organization, uh, and maybe they do some welfare work here and there, and all those things are, you know what they are, they're not bad. Uh, however, the goal of life is nowhere to be found in those traditions. It's certainly not there. The real goal of life is we've been talking about bhakti. You won't sniff it out from uh, the people who are uh, uh, involved in these various traditions. And that's why Prabhupada calls them out, you know. Uh, particularly, he didn't, he wasn't very fond of Ramakrishna and uh, Vivekananda. So, uh, um, this gives us the segue into this concept of imagining that we can become God somehow or another. You know, God is always God. He can never become something else. We can never become God. That is not possible. Those who say that we can become God are either defrauding us, lying, uh, pathetically mistaken, or just playing philo philosophical games. There's no such thing as becoming God. Yet, we are always a part of God. We are God the part and never God the whole. So the super soul is in everyone's heart. We know we all come from God. So 
We come from God, and yet we are only a particle of God. That's how the Vedic literature is explain it. So, yes, we are God in a sense, in as much as we are God the part or God the particle. But we are never God the whole, and there is a God the whole, who is the entirety of everything, all wrapped into one, all rolled into one. So uh, people who claim or say, and many of these uh, various so-called uh, yogis and godmen and uh, uh, dadas and deities and uh, you know all these others, they claim that you can become God by following some mystic process, which is flatly not true. But uh, you can make some good money doing that anyway. So uh, if that's what you're into, go for it, you know. But uh, that's why we're, we don't uh, really uh, 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 give any kind of credence or uh, why we don't support that kind of uh, uh, an, a philosophical viewpoint. That's what I'm trying to struggle to get out there. So, uh, we have been talking about these things, and I'll wrap them up here a bit, uh, that uh, these are how we can judge the authenticity of an approach uh, to the supreme or to a religious practice, uh, or a person who's supposed to be uh, describing these things. One of them is that they're in a disciplic succession line. They're not a fresh coming up with some new thing that never was ever seen or heard before by anybody anywhere. So they're following a group of teachers from uh, uh, time immemorial. And uh, this is something you all mentioned when I asked the question two or three weeks ago. And second idea is that they're following a philosophical tradition. There is a tradition, so there, these are not just random people coming up with random philosophies, but they're following a tradition. And the other thing is that they're knowledgeable in Scripture. And uh, another thing is that they're genuine in uh, their intention. They're not saying they're doing something when actually they're doing something else. They're not telling you they're helping you to develop spiritual qualities when actually they're just trying to uh, uh, pad their bottom line. So um, they're not showcasing ecstasies. We see this also go on, especially in India, where people uh, swoon and shake and quiver and writhe on the ground and all those kind of stuff, purportedly from uh, some kind of ecstasy. Uh, this is a sure sign that's usually some uh, hanky panky is going on there, you know. And uh, people who claim to be God men or a God, you know, whatever, you know, you can give them a pass too. They're not really going to help in any kind of way. And, uh, so uh, the other thing, of course, is, <laughs> God, uh, that they're not trying to explain spiritual life while they're actually engaged in secret sex affairs with uh, some of their followers. This is a sure sign that the whole thing is uh, uh, got both wheels in the ditch on the side of the road, you know, that uh, this is a sure sign that this is not a spiritual uh, endeavor, you know. Um, it just never works that way. Uh, but uh, there are traditions and people who even suggest that uh, uh, one should engage in various kinds of, uh, you know, uh, sex activities to increase their spiritual life. There is certainly movements like that. You know, Bengal was the uh, wellspring of uh, the Bolas, the Olas, the Garunga Nagaris, the, the uh, Nityananda Vamsas, and a lot of others who were, not all of them, but some of them were, um, you know, uh, basically... Uh, all about the idea of trying to use sex as some kind of uh, spiritual process. Uh, and of course, we're not talking about marital sex, we're talking about sex in a widely distributed way. And of course, I'll just uh, pull in the last two things. 
Um, we also should understand if the person uh, can recognize that Krishna is the highest and that uh, understanding that bhakti is the highest. This is how we can know someone's a genuine authority. Um, bhakti is not the sole property of the Hare Krishna movement, but uh, at least to understand that developing <clears throat> devotional service to the Supreme Lord is the highest goal. Any uh, religion or philosophy or organization that supports that uh, basic philosophical understanding is going in the right direction. All right. Um, so we'll read a little bit more. I may have to terminate a little early today. Uh, uh, let me see here. So Prabhupada made the point to the reporter. Uh, he made two points to him that um, people are, uh, at least some, are turning away from uh, Western religion to Eastern religion. And the reason is that, A, they do not find uh, detailed uh, explanation of why things are the way they are in spiritual philosophical terms. So because they don't have deep integrated knowledge, then they also find the uh, religious teachings to be apparently superficial or as they feel, maybe even superstitious. So they find it hard to um, think of their spiritual life in real terms because there's no explanations of anything. So therefore, it uh, tends either to become watery and a person uh, becomes uh, uh, gradually apostate from their religious following or they become uh, uh, seized up with various kinds of outrageous dogmas and... Uh, and uh, ideas that cannot be justified at all. And these are both problems when there's not any detailed explanation. So we need detailed explanation. And then, of course, the second point that Prabhupada makes is that uh, one has to actually follow the religious teachings. If the uh, clergy uh, have uh, rationalized somehow or another that eating meat is fine, then certainly the, the regular congregation will also think that meeting, eating meat is fine. And if they do, then uh, this means that, uh, you know, uh, everything is becoming an outward show only. We are claiming we are compassionate. We're claiming that we are forgiving. We're claiming that we have highest morality, but at the same time, we somehow are blind to the suffering of animals. So, uh, of course, as Prabhupada mentions here, the, the uh, Old Testament, the, uh, you know, uh, the uh, Ten Commandments, they do clearly state, thou shalt not kill. Of course, that was the original translation in all the translations of the Bible up until recently when uh, Christians were being challenged by vegetarians, you know, and then uh, they began to reinterpret the uh, Ten Commandments as saying, thou shalt not murder. And so if you look in m many Bibles today, you'll see the Bibles say not that thou shalt not kill, but rather that thou shalt not murder. So uh, I guess it makes them feel a little bit better about it, but... Um, uh, there's no doubt that meat eating is a nasty business. Okay, so um, let me see. We'll go a little bit further. Ooh. Gail, can you read and can you see? Are you in communication? Maybe not. Let me see. It takes a while to get the... Uh, Okay. Mm -hmm. 
So, uh, Hello? Lodge Sheila, or you, is that, who is that? Um, it's me, it's Lodge Sheila. Okay, can you read then? All right, you're able to see it. Yes, when, where would you like me to start? Um, um, where are you asking me? That's where the journalist says that. Journalist, are you asking me? Sheila Pabupat, yes, journalist. Well, thou shalt not kill is obviously an ethic, and it's timeless, and it's valid. But man is not really interested. Srila Prabhupada, yes, that's right. They are not really interested in religion. It is simply show bottle. If you do not follow the regulative principles, then where is your religion? Journalist, I'm not arguing with you. I couldn't agree with you more. I'm in total agreement. It doesn't make any sense. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not worship no other gods before me. Thou shalt not covet, covet thy neighbor's good. Thou shalt honor thy father and thy mother. Those are beautiful. Srila Prabhupada, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife. But who is following this? Journalist, very few. Srila Prabhupada, so how can they say they're religious? And without religion, human society is animal society. Journalist. All right, but let me ask you this. How does your interpretation differ from the basic Judeo-Christian ethic of the Ten Commandments? Srila Prabhupada. There is no difference, but as, I, as I told you, none of them are strictly following the Ten Commandments. So I simply say, please follow God's commandment. That is my message. Journalist. In other words, you're asking them to obey those principles. A Srila Prabhupada. Yes, I don't say that Christians should become Hindu. I simply say, please obey your commandments. I'll make you a better Christian. That is my mission. I don't say... God is not in your tradition. God is only here in ours. I simply say, only God. I don't say you have to accept that God's name is Krishna and no other. No, I say, please obey God. Please try to love God. Journalist, let me put it this way. If your mission and the mission of the Western Judeo-Christian ethic are the same, again, let me ask. Why is it that the younger people, or people in general, are disenchanted, are trying to go towards the Eastern-oriented religion? Why are they going towards the Eastern if both are the same? Srila Prabhupada, because Judaism and Christianity are not teaching them practically. I am teaching them practically. Journalists, in other words, you're teaching them what you feel is a practical, everyday method for attaining this fulfillment of man's spirit. Srila Prabhupada, love of Godhead is being taught both in the Bible and in the Bhagavad Gita. But today's religionists are not actually teaching how to love God. I am teaching people how to love God. That is the difference. Therefore, young people are attracted. Journalists, all right. So the end is the same, but it's the method of getting there that's different. Srila Prabhupada, no. The end is the same, and the method is also the same. But these so-called religious leaders are not teaching people to follow the method. I am teaching them practically how to follow it. Journalists, let me ask you something that we've run into a great deal just recently. The biggest problem holding men and women back from love of God and following the Ten Commandments is the problem. How should I put it? Well, a sexual problem. Now, I'm stating something that's obvious. We've all gone through this. Okay, Shri so uh, <laughs> Sheila will cap this one here. So uh, this also uh, okay. is kind of what I've been underlining uh, as we've been going through this discussion, this idea that... Um, one has to practically follow some kind of religious activity. 
Uh, if you claim to be a, 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 an adherent of some religious tradition, then there should be something in your everyday life that is on a daily basis connecting you with that religion that you claim to be a part of. Um, we will not be religious just by, you know, going through the motions uh, once a week for an hour or two hours. A spiritual life has to be a daily thing. We have to focus on the Supreme Lord throughout the 24 hours that we conduct our everyday activities. And so that's why uh, becoming genuinely spiritually uh, uh, practicing a particular genuine spiritual tradition is what makes a difference. If you're either not practicing or what you're practicing is not a genuine spiritual religious tradition or you don't even intend to follow a spiritual religious tradition, then it won't work. You won't get any, you won't get any real benefit out of it. So... Uh, um, let me think here. Uh, maybe we can finish this up. Let me go back to the... Uh, book here. But do we have someone who could read? Indrani, would you like to read? Can you see sure, that? Maharaj. Where is this? I can uh, see it, but it's not clear. Um, oh, I see. So that means your your internet connection is not very good. I try though. I try, my right. Let me know where to start. Where it says uh, we just read. Uh, Laja Sheila just read that uh, one about the sexual problem. We're probably starting to talk about how uh, the whole problem of sexuality figures into uh, religion and. Uh, why people are having trouble with religious uh, observances because of their um, inability to cope with their uh, sexual motivations. So you can start here, more or less the top of the pages where Prabhupada says, yes, everyone. Prabhupada, yes, everyone, journalists. And there is nothing in Western culture or religion that tracks or helps a young person to cope with this difficult problem. I went through it. We all have. No, now, do you, in your messages, give the young people something to hang on to? And if so, what? I ask my disciple to get married. I don't allow this nonsense of boys living with girls. No, you must get yourself married and live like gentlemen, journalists. Well, let me get a little more basic. How about when one is 14, 15, 16 years old? Pure Papa. One thing is that we teach our boys how to become brahmachari, how to live the life of cel celibacy. Um, how to control their senses in Vedic culture. Marriage generally does, doesn't take place until the, the boy is about 24, 25, and the girl is about 16 or 17. And because they, ex they are experiencing the spiritual pleasure of Krishna consciousness, they are not simply interested in sex life. So don't say, don't mix with women, stop sex life, but we, regulate everything under the high the higher principle of Krishna consciousness. In this way everything goes nicely. Journalists, so so your disciples don't just bite their tongue or their lips and say I won't touch her or him. There is a substitute, Srila Prabhupada. Yes, a higher taste. That is Krishna consciousness and it is worth Working. I'm already teaching Western men and women how to control their sexual impulse. My disciples, that my disciples that you are you see here are all American. They they are not imported from India. 
journalists, one thing I want to know is what you think about people like this famous mantra selling guru who turned me off and so many other people. My daughter, my daughter was very involved in that kind of thing for a while. She's ter she she's terribly delusioned. Disillusioned. Yeah. Srila Prabhupada, the, psych, psych, the psychology is that Western people, especially the youngsters, are hankering after spiritual life. Now, if somebody comes to me and say, Swamiji, initiate me, I immediately say, you have to follow these four principles, no meat eating, no gambling, no intoxication, no illicit sex. Many go away, but this mantra se mantra seller he do he do he does not put his restriction that's just his phys his physician who says you can you can do whatever you like you simply take my medication and you will be cured the physician will be very popular journalists yes he kill a lot of people but He'll be very well liked. Peter Prabhupada, yes, laugh. And the real physician says, you cannot do this, you cannot do that, you cannot eat this. <laughs> this is, this is what, who put? The botheration for people. Botheration for people. That's what, they wanted some something very cheap, therefore the cheaters come to cheat them. They take the opportunity to become people because people wanted to be cheated. Oh, well, let us take advantage, you, you see. So the rascal advised people, you are God, everyone is God. You just have to realize yourself. You have simply forgotten. You take this mantra and you'll become God. You'll become powerful. There is no need to control the, the senses. You can drink, you can have unrestricted sex life. And whatever, and whatever you like. People like this, oh, simply by 15 minute meditation, I shall become God and have to pay only $35. Millions of people will be ready to do it. For American, $35 is not very much, but multiply by million, it becomes $35 million. Wow. All right, all right. So uh, that's good. So uh, we can. <laughs> <laughs> we can kind of see where Prabhupada is going with this, that uh, he's, um, you know, uh, showing what we've been talking about all along, the same idea that um, you cannot make genuine progress in spiritual life unless you are, uh, to some extent, uh, engaged in self-control. If you're not self-controlled or you don't have any inclination towards it, you won't make any genuine progress in spiritual life, despite what anybody may tell you. You may even pay $35, but you're still not going to uh, make any progress in spiritual life. Heck, you may even pay $40 and still not uh, make any progress in spiritual life. So um, the progress of spiritual life comes from hearing bona fide information on practice and uh, philosophical superstructure. Both of those are there. We have an understanding of philosophical superstructure and we have a practice. Then we can uh, daily start to use that to reshape our lives, to reshape our uh, emotions, to reshape our priorities in our actions. And in this way, we become purified from within. And people who say you can get it some other way, you know, uh, maybe not. You know, we're going to kind of leave that one for someone else to go down that road. But, uh, you know, uh, this is very popular idea that you can have your cake and eat it too that you can do what you want to do and somehow or other by magic or hook or crook or uh, magic pink gold dust or whatever it is, um, that we will still get the ultimate goal, which is some kind of, uh, 
you know, happiness or satisfaction or whatever it is. This will never work. The problem with engaging our senses with their objects is it always heads us in the wrong direction if we don't have it within a framework of control. No matter which of our senses we're talking about, we have to have a control framework around it. And if someone gives way to intoxication, if someone gives way to meat eating, if someone gives way to illicit sex, if someone get, gives way to gambling, all these four things are the four things that more <coughs> destroy a human life than any other thing. So, um, uh, these four things were spoken about in the first canto of Srimad Bhagavatam in the 18th and 19th chapter about, you know, Prickett and uh, his recognizing that the dark age of Kali had begun and it was gradually pushing aside all good qualities in human beings. He knew that as time went on, things would get worse. And of course, Kali was given four places to reside. Kali was given a place to reside wherever there was animal slaughter. Kali was given a place to reside wherever there was intoxication. <coughs> and Kali was given a place to reside wherever there was gambling and also a place to reside wherever there was illicit sex. So illicit sex, gambling, intoxication, meat eating. These four things are what most people consider the most wonderful enjoyments in life. But it's quite plain that these four things are all individually known for how they can completely destroy a person's life. They destroy a person's life because they take over the consciousness of an individual. And once they've taken over the consciousness of an individual, then in very quick time, an individual can go from being a normally functioning human being to being completely out of it, to being either a criminal, to being either a mental uh, basket case, to being either a, uh, a health ruin where they have to uh, engage in so many medical practices just to keep themselves alive. Uh, these are all the uh, likely outcomes of people who spend too much time in any of these four principles. Besides these four principles, there was a fifth place where Kali Yuga was given uh, as a place to reside by a Parikit Maharaj, and that fifth place was wherever gold was hoarded. So um, this is uh, what Prabhupada's wrapping this up with, you know, that... Uh, you can say these things. I'll give me thirty-five dollars. I'll give you a mantra, and you'll become God. Sounds great. Doesn't work, but it sounds good. Uh, you know, you can uh, come to my meditation sessions and meditate twice a day for you know thirty minutes at a time, and you will become peaceful and prosperous, and all your material anxieties will go away. But sounds great, but it doesn't ultimately make any real big difference in your life. Uh, so you can allow people to engage in illicit activities, but that's going to stunt their spiritual life. And if you don't engage them in the right activities, it's not going to uh, jumpstart their spiritual life. So in one case, their spiritual life is not jumpstarted. In the other case, uh, their material life is... Um, sandbagged so um, this is the uh, the problem um, let's see how much we've got left here if we can finish it off today or we've got to wait for next week Well, it looks like we've got more than I've got the time for because I'm going to have to break it off. Let's just ask as before we um, cap it off here. Um, anyone have any particular questions about any of this that we've talked about today? 
Yeah, I, I have a quick question. Um, you know, yeah. I I thought Kali Yuga was the name of this age that we're in. Mm-hmm. Um, but when you were saying that Kali needed a place to reside where this and that and that and that, right. um, it made it sound like Kali's uh, an, an entity, like a living entity. Yes. <laughs> I, I didn't even know that. I thought right. Kali was just the name of this age. It is the name of the age. But uh, as you'll recognize that uh, Kali is the personification of the age that we live in. So uh, Kali is a person as well as an age, you know. Um, Generally in our modern world, we never think like this anymore. We assume everything is impersonal or depersonalized uh, uh, systems and machines working, you know. Uh, and this is part of our uh, modern mythology of the 21st century. This is the way we've come to think about things. But it's erroneous, you know. Um, there's no proof of it. And uh, Kali has been given a certain time to be able to uh, engage in the activities that Kali is known for. Uh, namely, you know, uh, giving people the motivation to engage mostly in gambling, intoxication, illicit sex, and meat eating. So uh, these are the things that Kali motivates people towards doing. Um, and he will continue to do this for the whole uh, 432,000 years that Kali Yuga will be in office. Uh, we have 427,000 of them left, so we've got the biggest part of it ahead of us. Uh, and at the end of Kali Yuga, that's when uh, Kalki Avatar, who will be born in Shambhala, he will rise and he will force Kali to let go of the human race. And then Satya Yuga will start. And Satya Yuga is also a person. And Treta Yuga is also a person. So uh, when Satya Yuga comes into office, then Kali Yuga has to go and hide again. At least he cannot be manifest in this uh, plane that we live on. So he's both a person and an age. By the way, there is Kali, which is just to make things confusing. So the Kali, and that's the age that we live in, and it's also this uh, person, this man, who is depicted as uh, promoting these uh, sinful activities. And there's Kali, which is the dreadful form of uh, Durga Devi, who is Shiva's wife. And Kali is the famous form with all the skulls around her neck, you know, uh, because uh, she is... uh, uh, prone to whack people's heads off. So uh, that's just to distinguish the two because sometimes people can get the two confused. In the Sanskrit language, they're two different words, but because they're spelled the same way in English, uh, they can get confused. Well, I learned, I learned many new things tonight, but thank you. Oh. Okay, good. (laughs) I'm happy that uh, we went through some uh, interesting territory tonight. Uh, We went a couple of uh, detours that I hadn't planned, but that's great. I'm not I'm not uh, uh, worried about that. Uh, And hopefully, I'm starting to get a workflow, and I'll be able to get more of these things up on the uh, you know new uh, YouTube station. The Forest Dwellers 109, you know, uh, so. Uh, is it 108? Yeah, 108, right. <laughs> now, I'll get myself, uh, I'll send people to the wrong place. I, I can't ever get it right, you know. <laughs> you know, I, I just, I was not successful in getting on. I've tried many different things, but I have had links sent to me. Cynthia sent me a link, so thank you, Cynthia. But I've been unable to get on on my own. But I've got. Did my... you did you do what I said on the on the phone? On the... I did, I did, and it just isn't working. And I've had even people like talk me through it, 
Uh-huh. Still not working. Really? It doesn't it doesn't put me but at the t- top. I'm surprised by that. Yeah. Nope. Uh-uh. Yeah. I doesn't mean, work uh, I I could say I'm surprised, but I'm not, you know. <laughs> the uh the material <laughs> internet is uh, you know, uh I think I have issues that happened only on my computer that even other people don't have. So uh, some some things just are like that, you know. That uh, uh, and, and Cynthia said that she spent some time trying to figure out why it wouldn't work for me. And she's just, you know, I've given up, she's given up, so I'll just do the links. Okay, okay. <laughs> Well, if you get on, if you go to any one of the uploaded uh, YouTube videos, you should be able to subscribe, and then you that'll automatically be in your web browser for um, YouTube, and you'll be able to get on from there. At least that's the way I think it works. Well, that's the funny thing, Maharaj. Yesterday I got on and I subscribed, but then uh-huh. when I tried to get on again today, I couldn't. Well, but there's a reason for up. that. I know you have to go. That's a, there's a huh? reason for that. There's a reason for that, you know, and that was because I changed oh. it last night from uh, Forest Dwellers to Forest Dwellers 108. I changed it, and that's probably why you couldn't get it this morning, you know. I was afraid that would happen to people, and I'm sure it has happened to people. But I thought in the long okay. run... That uh, to me, Mara. right. I thought in the long run it would be better to have it as Forest Dwellers 108 because I thought that by putting the whole thing together as a two-word package plus a number, it would be unique enough that uh, uh, people would be able to just go right to it in YouTube. But apparently, uh, as we all know, the best laid plans in uh, cybernetics sometimes don't pan out and uh, it didn't seem to make any difference at all. Thank all you right. very much. <laughs> all right. So uh, thank you all very much for attending. I'm happy that you're here and I hope you all learned something. I certainly had a chance to uh, try to do a little bit more research and try to present some things in a, in a way that I haven't done before. So uh, we'll see you again, same time, same station. Thank you, Maharaj. On, uh, Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you, Maharaj. Hari, Hari. Hari, Hari. Nice dress, Maharaj. Hari, Hari. Hari, Hari. Nice dress, Maharaj. Hari, Hari. We'll, see, we'll see you all very soon. Hari, Krishna. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you.